which is appropriate because we have such wonderful contributions already about the perspective as a researcher and the perspective as a journalist, and I certainly can't present to that. Uh, I have a few hats up there at the moment. I founded Robot Garden, which is a robot makerspace. I'm a contributor to RoboHub, part of the team. Um, I founded Robot Launchpad to understand what was happening in the intersection between startups and robotics. And I'm the managing director of Silicon Valley Robotics, which is the non-profit association for robotics in Northern California. And most of the time, this is what I feel like, because my background was science studies rather than <coughs> So theology test was so high, I just can't understand the difference between mass culture and popular culture. It was 38 multiple choice questions and we only had 15 minutes to finish it. Are you fucking kidding me? I just took a quiz, a quiz, not even a test for control systems engineering and I had to derive a transfer function for a double mass spray damper system and I only had 20 minutes. What's a transfer function? Jesus Christ, it's like talking to a child. What did they teach you in these humanities classes? Well, stop. Is this because scientists and engineers have real jobs and thus have not time to properly influence educational policy while you are in humanities? You <coughs> have taking it over and minimizing math and physics because you suck at them? Without arts and humanities, you couldn't appreciate beauty or culture, and you wouldn't know how to feel. You would be reduced to a robot that thinks only in black and white. You mean ignoramus. Do you know how much beauty and symmetry there is in Maxwell's equations? And the sophistication behind those seemingly simple equations and what they can explain competes with anything else of beauty created by man. What are Maxwell's equations? I can't believe this. To get a degree in mechanical engineering, I'm required to take an art class. And yet, you can get a degree in art and not even know that the second law of thermodynamics is... What is thermodynamics? Dear Lord, Clausius is rolling in his grave right now. Do you know that this is an indictment of the American educational system? We must see advertisements for products that tell people that they can make a simple modification to their car and make it at 100 miles per gallon. I wonder what kind of poor saps fall for it. You. You are that kind of poor sap. I was going to buy one of those. They really work. Did you know you can also buy a perpetual motion device online? You can power your house forever on a single banana peel. Please stop talking. Every time you speak, you make my head hurt. This is why everyone should be required to study math and physics. I can't afford to waste any more time with this conversation. I need to finish reviewing the plus transforms. That reminds me, Jersey Shore will be on in half an hour. I need to check my DVR. VR. Okay, now how to get out of that. Yeah, so my background was science studies, understanding the intersection between technology and society, human-robot interaction, humanities, not engineering, soft science, not hard science. And although I was studying robots and presenting papers at robotics conferences, I frequently felt like the light entertainment, rather than someone who was trying to grasp the broad outlines of the science and to have a shaping impact in some fashion on how that science was going to be impacting on me. And it occurred to me that I hadn't actually found a way of expressing the value in what I was doing. So that's kind of how I ended up as Managing Director of Silicon Valley Robotics. I was involved in the process of translating what I thought was interesting into language that had value for the people that were 
to my mind, my partners. So instead of being the dumb teddy, I was having a conversation that didn't make everybody's head hurt. Um, and it's yeah. part of that conversation for me was quite interesting because it actually related to the notion of value and valuing things. And one of the areas that I have found I've offered the most value has been in helping people create startups out of their robotic um, ideas. And it's turning the ideas into products. And I, I find that a very interesting third perspective that was neither my humanities perspective nor the engineering perspective, but has turned out to be a very interesting translation method in between the two. And so that's more or less exactly what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to run through something that for me seems quite simple, but I realized over the last two years, I've talked about it and I've received so many inquiries from people to give them the templates or the documents or links to more information about it, but I realized that something that I assumed was more or less basic <coughs> information was information that people weren't finding easy to access. So we've just posted that on um, RoboHub and on Robot Launch and Silicon Valley Robotics. Um, if I didn't express that, we're the non-profit tech cluster for robotics in the Northern California area, and we support innovation and commercialization of robotics technologies. Um, we're representing companies, startups, STEM organizations, and robotics professionals. Um, and for me, this organization is kind of the ground zero for understanding technology transfer and the intersection of technology and society. So why this kind of value transaction is so important is because it's about proving your hypotheses. And it's about taking it to the next level, past what you have to do as a researcher. I think everybody I talk to believes in the value of the idea that they have. But it is actually significantly harder proving that that has value to other people. You have a hypothesis that it has value to other people. The next steps in transferring the idea to a product are in proving that other people care enough about what you've done to, uh, to give it some value. Um, that's, that's what launching a startup's about, that's what looking for investment's about, and that's what actually marketing products about. So two of the really important tools are customer development methodology and lean startup methodology. Two of the main proponents, Steve Blank and Eric Reese, and you're probably familiar with their work, and if you aren't, if you want to progress your ideas into any form of commercialization, then I thoroughly recommend becoming familiar with Steve Blank and Eric Reese. And they've come out of the incredible business success of the software, mobile, and internet worlds, and the fact that there's very fast metrics, um, very available, comprehensive metrics that are almost instantaneous, telling you when you're doing something right, and when your changes are having impact and what those impacts are. So, there's been a lot of research and there's a lot of money in that area. And I thought it was very interesting seeing how we could capitalize on this approach, the metric approach from software startups and utilizing the hardware startups. And I'm just one of many people that's finding that interesting at the moment. Uh, the National Science Foundation has been using Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad for the last two years. They're funding scientists 50K each to do the Lean Launchpad. They've done 300 teams so far, and their metrics are finding something like a 63% success in teams that are doing the Launchpad as opposed to 18%, and you'd have to look at their metrics to see more of the details about it because I didn't bring that with me. Uh, I just think that it's validating what was seen as being something applicable solely to software startups and that sort of world is being utilized in the hard sciences now as an MSF funded program. And the core of Steve Blank's method is get out of the building and test your hypothesis on real people, real customers. That's really, if I said nothing else in this whole talk, 
It's get out of the building, test your hypothesis on real people. That's it. I should just leave that now, actually. Um, but I'll just say the tools that I found I understand the basic may not be as clear. Your tools are your 30-second elevator pitch, which is very similar to, as Sabine said, your Twitter message, 160 characters to describe what you're doing. Can you do that very succinctly and very clearly? Can you do a one-page investor summary? And can you do a 10 to 13 slide PowerPoint pitch deck? And um, a good way of getting to these points is using something like a business model canvas. Um, Alexander Osterwalder is probably state of the art in a good example of the business model canvas, talking about generating the information that you need in this 10 to 13 slide deck, which you then condense down into your one page summary, which you then condense down into your one or two sentence elevator pitch. And again, these actual templates for this document and the uh, 13 slide PowerPoint deck are on RoboHub and Robot Launch. Um, that's a little bit hard to read, but this is effectively each of the 13 slides. And I'm just going to run through each of the 13 slides very quickly for everyone. It seems obvious, but the title with your name, the title, the name of your product and your name, and just that. You've got to be setting your scene. And You've got to make it look good, because this is the first impression that you create. Don't overload it with information, but put the key information up there. And it's amazing how many people forget to put either their name or the name of their product. And that's all you need to have. Your overview should be shorter than this slide. This slide's telling you that you need to have up there. Your job is to turn that into a very succinct couple of statements. And again, it's kind of a summary of everything else that's going to follow. And I think the important part is why should anyone care? Because I know you care, but how can you convey that other people also would care? That is the really hard thing. Your founding team. I don't think I can do better than don't be shy, just be brief. Okay. So if you did ever work for NASA, yes, put it up there, even if it was just a summer internship. Don't explain it was a summer internship. If you did redesign an entire city subway system, put it up. Just be brief. Don't explain details. You have a, a very short attention span of people. And I think one of the things that it's important to remember is that many of the investors or other people that you're talking to in the industry or what have you, even if they did have an engineering background, are a bit like the W10. And they're also very busy. And they hear a lot of inflated, overhyped pitches. And you've got to convey serious information very quickly, very smoothly, very cleanly. Or you've lost the attention. And once it's lost, you've lost it. Next thing, and this is where people all go wrong. Because you have a hypothesis about who your market is and who you're going to, to relate to. And it's often speculative and not proven. And investors are very, very good at separating speculation from substance. That is effectively their entire career arc. So an example is, my product's going to solve the problems of the aging population, i.e. 50% of the world. Highly speculative. A realistic figure would be, this is for aging Americans who own their own home. And that may be the total available market, but your actual addressable market is much more likely to be aging Americans who own their own home in rural areas underserviced by alternative care providers who are members of the AARP Association, who are our closed market channel. So at every step of the way, you've reduced your actual addressable market, but you've created a far more compelling picture of your ability to deliver something to those people. And cite your sources. This, again, seems really obvious, and it's where people can go astray. You know what it is you're doing. 
you have to demonstrate it. And you have to do it in a way that can often include the really basic information so that it may be the algorithm, but you probably need to show that uh, there's context. So it might be the algorithm that's your product, but it's a GPS in the car that's connected to the cloud where your algorithm is working out how close the other cars are, which is then helping you do safer driving within the lanes, put all the pieces together so that people can really see clearly that that goes with that, goes with that, goes with that. This will change a lot because as you research who your actual customers are, how you address them, who your partners are, and who your competition are will continue to change. So you should expect to pivot this quite a bit. It means you're actually doing real work. And one of the things that I continually get feedback on is most important is what traction do you have? And that is simply what reflections of you proving your hypothesis are there. And Strategic relations, are you a member of um, X alumni association? Do you partner with some large company? What you can imagine. The competition is something that, by the way, you're not there to publicize, to promote your competition. But if you can't say where your competition exists, everybody can smell a rat. You've either not done your research or you're concealing what's out there. And pretty much that's the investor's key job, is to go out there and find out who your competition is, how they work, what they do. So put it up there. But you don't need to sell them. The barriers to entry are why you are the right choice right now, what you have going for you. Finance figures, pretty simple. Important. You are about to borrow $3 million. What are you going to spend it on? It shows what your predicting plan is, what your scope is, what your reach. Uh, it shows what your what you think is important next in your development plan. And finally, just simply, $3 million is our ask for this next round, or whatever it is that you're asking. And the close. And that's where you put your contact information and all the details. And this is also the point where you make the passionate connection with your audience. You are selling yourself right now. You are the ambassador for your research and your product. And that was where I was going to finish. But first thing this morning, I got an email from a friend, and he reminded me of one of the other really important aspects. Once you start putting out information about what you do, especially as it's becoming a product, then you are legally reaching, then everything that you do can be considered advertising. And that half thought out press release or that YouTube video can live on long after you've taken it off your website. And if you have talked, to, if you've made claims about your competitors, and how you are much better. How can you prove that? They might go up to you. Just one of the things where you need to, first off, talk to attorneys once you start advertising. And you need to think that your advertising can consist of quite a range of things that aren't paid ads. And second off, advertising and engineering, two different sets of ways of looking at the world. As an engineer, you can think that this is a perfectly clear statement without understanding how the general public can interpret it very, very differently in a very wrong fashion. Ditto, your advertising can take what you thought was very clear and go and rewrite it in a fashion that is completely misrepresentative. And you need to be continually marrying up the two teddies in terms of dialogue. 